Right. Welcome, Dr. Edwin Bryant, to uh, Keenan Yoga Yoga Chats. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, without getting too much into the samskaras of Edwin's life, the uh, you know the the life of or well, spiritual life really. Um, and Edwin has had a very interesting life, um, and it starts with. I think uh, we've done this recording a couple of times. We haven't actually struck on one that I'm happy with yet. Um, and so I think I'm going to say this time, it, tell me that, that first part again, when you when you first had that inclination or, or some connection to India when you were at, uh, at school and you saw the film. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling your life story now because I know it a few well, times. We've done, we've done it more than once. Yeah, we? yeah, I know. Well, um, yeah, I went to one of these British boarding schools, which, uh, you know, sort of one of the, you know, one of the features of British culture. We have these boarding schools. Uh, they have them in America as well, but not not in the same way as we do in Britland. So my dad being, a, a you know, a, in the foreign office and the diplomatic service. So if you're in that, you know, sort of army overseas or diplomatic service or, or, or if you have the means, then it's in England, it's considered a desirable thing to send your kids to boarding school. Um, and my mom was Italian, of course, which is completely, complete, you know, opposite of that. You know, you yeah. kids around you as my poor, poor mom. I don't know how she dealt with it. But anyway, yeah. So I, my earliest memories. How old were you when you went? I think I was seven. Seven? God. Or eight. Not, not more than, definitely. It's younger. inhumane, isn't it? That, that British idea of sending the kids so young. I prep school. We went to prep school. I was, you know, you're just, uh, you're very young. Yeah. Uh, so, um. Let me think. I was 57. I was born in 57. Yeah, I've been seven, seven or eight. Anyway, so what you can cut any of this out you want, by the way. Um, you can chop chop this about if you want when you when you uh, before you if, if any of this is irrelevant. Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> so anyways, I, we, back in those days, we we uh, we had a, a film once once a week, and so we would sit all sit you know cram into this. There were these two rooms with this with this partition in the middle. You could roll back. It became kind of a large room you know this is all old, old days this is a real boarding school this is a boarding school where you this was corporal punishment every day you know this is not, not long after the you know, you know the british empire was run on the boarding schools and this was yeah you know, that's... this was in a, just right in the in the twilight of that in the mm -hmm. city, you know? and the, uh, anyway corporal punishment very strict if you if you you know spoke during meals Two on the backside at night with it with the cricket bat. If you ran in the with, cricket, the, with the cricket bat, a little cricket bat where they sign, yeah. sign their names. <laughs> two, if you walked with your hands in your pockets, two. If you ran in in the indoors, two. If you spoke after lights out, two. I'm talking draconian. You know, all, but by the time you know, in the nine years I was there, but by the time I was, you know, it was all changed, all changed, and then you right. know, didn't hit kids anymore. But in the beginning, it was brutal. It was an old time boarding school. But anyway. That must have uh, left his mark, not just I, physically. I, I was okay. I just, but I look back now at some of the kids that were bullied. You don't think about it at the time, but there were kids that were bullied relentlessly. Yeah. And I, and I look back now and I just, I just feel, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't a bully, nor was I, bullied, <laughs> but there were kids that were bullied. I mean, I'm talking bullied. I mean, I'm talking about they had like the slave trade. Where you had, a, you know, the, the big kids would sit on a piece of corrugated iron with a bit of rope and the, the young kids had to pull them around like a chariot, uh, you know, bare chested it. And then they would whip them with stinging nettles like, you know, I mean, I'm talking whole time, <laughs> almost Dickensian boarding. School. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was, so in the, in, in, it, we would have these films and um, once a week and, um, you know, the kid used to. Pickham was it was into John Wayne and and cowboy movies. So every week, every week, every week, it's cowboy movie. But one day, for some reason, uh, uh, somehow or other, by accident, I think, a film about the British Raj in India snuck into the into the into that weekly viewing, that week's viewing. And um, I just remember watching it with utter transfixed f fascination because not not the film. It was some film about you know some polo match i can't even remember but the yeah. landscape, landscape of india in the film was utterly right transformative you know and 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 why would it have been so you know obviously you know hindus and hinduism would say you know they're part you know it's it's triggering past life recollections because there was an extremely son strong sense of belongingness and uh, you, i've got to go there that that was very clear. I, I got to go to India, and I was just a kid. I never, I didn't probably yeah. didn't know where India was on the map, 
but I got to yeah. go there. So that I think that that was my first sams samskara in this life that I recall. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I just, you know, I just was always that was always there. And then as I got older, I started reading, you know, the usual es esoterica that people interested in the spiritual life oh. are interested in, like, you know, Don, what was it, Don, you know, Castellade, Castellade. Castellade, yeah, that was my first introduction yeah. on my dad's bookshelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Tales of Power. Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, and what was the other one? Siddhartha, those kinds Sid of books. Yes, Herman Hess, yeah. But cool then you, I mean, story, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you made it, I mean, you made it when you went over finally, it was very, very different to the, the old Raj, right? Because you, you kind of went, did you go overland, as I remember, right? I went overland, so I was one of these characters, and I mean this literally, not, not rhetorically. But <laughs> I would say the very, very, very last, literally, here's why I say that. There used to be this overland trail when I and, and the last place you could make a little bit of money. Remember, I was just, you know, I was a hippie. I was coming out of that hippie culture. Yeah. So, you, you know, we made uh, on, the, you know, so we went overland and then, you know, you, you could make money in France. Les Vendanges. Les Vendanges. You could go great picking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little money. Yeah. And you could so, so do two weeks. You could, you know, you, you, and you could follow the, the great season around. So it was just pocket money, really. But other than that. Um, the, the last place you could make money was in Tehran. And there you could teach English as a foreign language. Anybody, even if you, at that time, this was 78. So even if you didn't have credentials or anything, if you were, you know, English speaking, there were so many schools there. And I got there. I didn't know any, anything about this. I wasn't like reading newspapers. Like three days after the Shah was thrown out of the country. And there was a two, three month period uh, before Khomeini came into, into the country. Yeah. I was there for that three month period. Incredible. Completely just by, so when I say literally the last person, I actually mean literally. When I got there, there were, you know, Westerners walking around. By the time I'd left, nobody, no Westerners mm -hmm. on the street. I, I, I was staying in this funky little, really lower end hotel behind the big Amir Kabir Hotel. The big Amir Kabir, Kabir Hotel was where the hippies used to stay on their overland routes. Got there, it was full. Time I left, utterly empty. And it was dangerous. Uh, yeah, you know, I was going to say, were there riots at that time? People would, every night. And I never yeah. figured it out because every night it felt like this huge, like a football crowd chanting anti, you know, I guess Shah slogan. slogan. Yeah. And a machine gun fire was like war. <laughs> and you went out at five in the morning and there, you never, I never saw any bullets. <laughs> And, and later, somebody said, I don't know if it's true, they were going around with big mic microphone, you know, it was just, you know, they were, I don't know who, who was doing it, the, probably the security services. I don't know, I, I never figured it out, how there was this, huge, like a British football club crowd chanting, and yet in the morning, there were no bullet marks in the buildings, no shells in the streets, I never figured it out. And someone said they were walking around with vans with big speakers, just kind of but I don't, I don't know whether to believe that or not, but mm -hmm. people were getting killed. There was curfew every night. There was shooting. There was clearly a volatile uh, period. And I was right there, but I didn't really. I, I, yeah, they were rounding up all of Shah's supporters, weren't they, and trying yeah. them in courtrooms in closed trials. In terms, of, in terms of like what seemed like to be a civil war at night, mm. these cha I, don't, I never figured out the, the reality or truth value of that. You know, it was just because why weren't there bullet shells all over the place? <laughs> Anyway, listen, cut this from the interview. <laughs> so, um, so like, and then and then Afghanistan closed. You were down. doing all this in a bus, were you? No, no, I was hitchhiking. Hitchhiking? Oh my god. Hitchhiking. And and then right after that, there was the 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 Russian Afghan war started. So then Afghanistan closed down. So when I say literally the last, I don't mean you know, you know, the last year or two. I mean literally right in that period. It was over. There were no. There was no more overland trail to India that there had been, you know, from the '60s into the '70s. So, um, so then, uh, so that, yeah. So eventually, got to India, and um, but yeah, I mean, like, Tehran was pretty intense, you know, because I was teaching English, but I wasn't getting paid because everything. The economy collapsed. People weren't even. There were lines going around, blocks and blocks and blocks, trying to get money out of the bank because everything had sort of. And they would stop us in the street, or stop me. But at the end, it was just I, I, there were no other Westerners that I could see. And they, you know, and it was, it was aggressive, right? Because they, everyone assumed you're American if you're white. And I would speak. I would tell them I was French, because Colmini was in Paris. 
Right, yeah. Somehow yeah. or other, there was this association of, okay, French is okay, you know. So I be, could speak French, obviously. Anybody who goes to a, a, a British boarding school ends up <laughs> learning French. I just part of it, Greek, Latin, all that. That was that generation. Anyway, so uh, yeah, then, so that was that was the little, you know, so it was quite an adventurous trail. It was quite a, a lot of adventures on that trail at that time. And you enjoyed it. You were enjoying it. Well, you know, you're young, you think you're immortal, you think you're eternal, you think you're immortal. It was, yeah, it was all a big adventure. Because oh, I kind of remember. I loved it. Oh, was it you? Was it, was it you that told me, or, or no? Was it something I read before? And you said you found yourself in a bus in the end. And this is kind of point oh, no, before you went later in the story. So then, by the time I got to India, and at first I went up north to Dharamsala, and because you know I thought, well, maybe Buddhism is where it's at. Because <laughs> Buddhism like was quite trendy, was quite trendy <laughs> in the yeah. West. So that seemed like an obvious place to start. Um, so I went up to Dharamsala and uh, spent, a, I don't know, a couple of months there. Start, you know, with the, at that time, they were, you know, they'd have classes and stuff with the, the lamas. And I, I, I knew at that time that, I, that Buddhism didn't, you know, it wasn't for me. I didn't, didn't have certain aspects of that. Um, you know, it was cool. It was a lovely place, Dharamsala. And, you know, the I never asked you what you did, what, what it was about Buddhism that didn't gel with you. I, um, well, because, you know, the idea that ignorance is, eternal and ultimate right there's no in other words what why is there why is there um anything rather than nothing right why is there this sort of why are we conscious why you know what is the cause when you when you start probing causal ultimate when you start posing ultimate causal questions you run into a stop sign in any tradition you know because you if you even if you posit a god you could say well why is there a god and, you know why, and yeah why infinite that, regression yeah yeah why is that any better than saying that, that there's just just matters that you know the nature of matter to do what it does but anyway so we all prefer one position over another unless we want to be agnostic so i the, so the causal explanations as to as to why there is reality and uh, that i didn't find that satisfying at all like the ultimate is avidya it's very similar to Advaita vedanta that you know of course of course there's the 12 the 12 spokes of the of, of the of the wheel but mm. but nonetheless ignorance and they're supposed to be all equal but ignorance does get sick it's you know picked out as somewhat especially significant so to think that this is just the way it is and has always been this flow of interdependent reality, mm. momentary interdependent reality, and 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 and, the, and somehow or the ignorance is is why we don't perceive it for what it is, and then you and then you I remember asking, well, what is ignorance? Well, what what's the cause of ignorance? And you don't get an answer to that. You won't get an answer to that in Buddhism. You won't get an answer to that in Advaita. In the Gita, Krishna, of course, says, well, this is my, this is mama maya duratyaya, right? Devi hi e shaguna mai mama maya. Krishna says, well, it's my shakti. I don't know if that's a, a, a more satisfying explanation, but, yeah. but, but you know, because I, I guess I'm a theist in my core, yeah. you know, that the position that there must be intelligence behind everything just resonates with me better than saying there is no intelligence. It's just the, the way things are. Right, yeah. So I, it's so somehow or other that, it was, that was more satisfying to me. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that Buddhism didn't really work for that reason. Um, I didn't find philosophical fulfillment in Buddhism. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So then eventually yeah. started, you know, was hitchhiking around, and I was heading, and then I got to Delhi eventually, and I was. Were you looking? Were you looking at the time? Oh, yeah. You were looking for something. Oh, of course right. I was. Oh, yeah, so yeah, there yeah. was some kind of, I mean, there was some sense of angst that they wanted to. Not not, not just some sense, intensely, the entire, the entire journey and, and the entire endeavor was fueled by intense existential angst. Right. And no other reason. I wasn't going sightseeing or anything like that. You know? So you were going to India in the first, that's why I said, were well, you happy there? Because it seems like you were enjoying yourself. But on the other hand, it seems that there was a, a great burning need, you know, a kind of Absolutely. Augustinian need to, uh, you know, to kind of get to some place of, yeah, except well, Augustine never hit the road, but yeah, something like that. <laughs> More he like came, a, he went it maybe to Carthage, didn't he? He came back to Carthage. Oh, did he? Uh, but wasn't yeah. he, from, he was from North Africa, though. Yeah, but he travelled, as he travelled back, he travelled back, he was making oh, he, a pilgrimage, wasn't right. he? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it was intense. But, you know, when you get to India, it's so exotically overwhelming, you know, from anything you elsewhere, really. Mm. Just that overload of, and there's deities everywhere. So I was in ecstasy, but still intensely. I wasn't 
going there as a spiritual uh, tourist. I was, I wanted, I, I made a vow I would never go back to the West and I was looking for like a monastery. I was looking for somewhere where I could dig in and, and, and just be a, a monk. I, I wanted to be a monk. Um, really? Oh, totally. I mean, I didn't have any money. I didn't have any money, by the way. No money. It, I never, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I never got paid in Iran or, or anything. What was, the, what was the reason though? I mean, if it's not a personal question, what was it? about your background or about your life that made you want such an extreme reaction to life? What was it you perceived that was insatisfactory with the way you saw life in the West? Well, I was deeply existentially unfulfilled. You know, I was seeking... Even meaning. at that age, very young. Yeah, from very, very young, yeah. So there are there is a certain kind of disposition in, in any culture that you we find these individuals that want that, that, that seek, you know, some deeper layer of meaning, like what is it all about? What who are we? And the usual big ticket existential questions, right? Yeah. Who are we and what happens after death? And why are we here? And why is there something and not nothing? So those kinds of questions, right? One can one can engage science to answer them, right? We can engage philosophy, and that's what philosophy is. I mean, what else is philosophy other than looking for causal explanations for things? Mm. Uh, uh, but there are those who have this idea that somehow there's something to be experienced, not just theoretically engaged in an intellectual way, but that, that, that there is some truth to be uncovered. And, and, I, and I didn't feel I was gonna get that in, in any of the contexts that I knew in the West. In, in, in I mean, I obviously went to Catholic boarding school, and and you know, so Catholicism for me was getting smacked, smacked on a bum with a with a cricket <laughs> mat every single night. We're walking with my hands in the pockets. Well, good, you know, well, that wasn't quite the type of spirituality. <laughs> you always had, so you always had this question. You know, Hindu right. would say, you know, Krishna would say in the in the end of the sixth chapter that if you, if you don't finish in one life, you pick up the next life. Right. I mean, there are sadhus. There are those, and we, we've all been to India, we've all seen, and, you know, millions, millions. There's a whole traveling subculture in India, still to this day, still mm. nouveau riche, desperate to be a world power, you know, up and coming India, still in that India with its glamorous, you know, suburbs of Delhi with all those high rises, there is this huge traveling subculture of sadhus and they don't get counted, they don't show up on the census, they sit in the trains and ticket ticket collector wouldn't even ask, think of asking. No. Them ticket. <laughs> they show up at the at the at the medical clinics and they you know if the if the bloke is the doctor's pious they'll treat them, or else they go to the you know whatever the Ramakrishna hospitals. There is still this whole used to be in Europe in the Middle Ages. Really? Well, we remember Robin Hood and Friar Tuck and all that. You'd have these these friars. There was a, you know remember Friar Tuck? He was a bit jolly. yeah yeah. Yeah. He, liked it. he liked his port, but I mean, he, yeah. was a, he was a one who was near wandering fry. I mean, there was that culture. There were there were traveling pilgrims in Europe. You had a little bit, nothing like India, but it, it's not that there wasn't there in the West. It just disappeared. But India still has it. So you and what, what? So connecting it with your question. So there, yeah. there, are, there is this disposition that is prepared to surrender everything. To seek truth. I mean, and and then, and of course, in the in the Christian culture, it became monastic. You you did that, dropped out of society, but then you moved into a, into a monastery and you studied, and then you went out and did charitable works in society. But India didn't really have that monastic tradition. You know, the monasteries in ancient India were Buddhist monasteries. They weren't really Hindu. The Hindu, if you look at the term ashram in all the old texts, it, the ashram refers to a sage sitting in a mud hut by the side of a river, not a big institutional kind of place i mean there were mm. big there were big they're affiliated places. aren't they the shankar are kind of affiliated the mass right so the sadhus yeah, are affiliated but then they travel around they don't actually stay that, there right that's shankara though that, that was an innovation he's borrowing that from a buddhist model the idea of right. the four shankara mats yeah there were mats i mean there's obviously huge temples in south india but that's more brahmins and you know priests and so forth mm -mm. The real spiritual seekers, you know, Shankar had his mats, it's true, but that wasn't typical. That was kind of an, that, he was, scholars, as I recall, there's a long time since I looked at this, scholars would say he's borrowing a Buddhist model, actually. Mm. He's borrowing a lot more than that. He's borrowing, you know, his two-tiered, you know, level of reality, certain philosophical things. But anyway, um, so, the, so, but the, traditionally, you have the model of a itinerant sadhu in India, or you have the sage, you see already in the Shvetashvatara in the cave, you have a solitary sage 
sitting in a cave, as the Shvetashvatara calls it, or in the Puranas, be sitting in a little a little mud hut at the bank on the side of a sacred river. That would be the intense spiritual seeker. So they're either wandering, itinerant, or they're uh, you know sedentary but highly mass, you know, completely renounced you know meditators on the banks of the river. So that, that so that would that was the model. But the point is, there are always there are those who uh, really are willing to you know go to the, the, those kinds of lengths to seek truth and, and under the conviction that it's something that can be experienced, not just theorized about, not just read about yeah. in books, not just yeah. studied about. Yeah. But really, so that's just that's just, that's just in, in who knows where that comes from. I mean, yoga psychology would say whatever's in the mind is put in there, and if it didn't get put in there in this life, it's put there in the life, the past life. Things mm. don't magically appear in the mind. They have to be, the samskaras have to already be there. 